For over a hundred years, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach has been serving Iowans. As our state recovers from COVID-19, we will continue to deliver information and education based on research to help you care for your family, manage stress, and support your community, your business, and your farm. We're here for you now, and we will be for the next 100 years. Together, we will build a strong Iowa. Hello everyone, welcome to Tips from an Expert. Um, I'm really excited for today's um, live. I mean, I'm always excited, but today I'm very excited, mainly because I think I have found someone that also appreciates puns and um, really good Instagram posts. So let's meet our expert for today, Randall. Hi, happy to be here. <laughs> Okay, I'm a little upset that you got the first pun in today <laughs> because I've been warning you of all of mine and then, but here we are. Um, I will try to behave, get it, be, okay, anyway, um, there's more of that, don't worry, there'll be plenty more. Great. So um, today's tips from our expert is um, helping honeybees through the winter. We are definitely feeling that shift in our weather and we've got a lot of like beekeepers out there that are probably already on the ball, but hopefully we'll provide them with some support to make sure that they keep their bees safe. I need my honey. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta yeah. have my honey. I like it in tea. I like it. Oh, that's a different. We'll do spend smart, eat smart recipes for honey, maybe, but that's not. Oh, yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Okay. So um, before I hop off and let you dive into all the content, just a reminder, if you're watching this live, throw any comments or uh, questions in the chat, or um, if you've got something that you've tried that's worked, you know, throw those things in the chat and we will add those um, at the end. We'll add them on screen. We'll talk about any of your questions or any of your ideas, um, things that have gone well for you, or maybe things you've learned from. If you're watching this after the live has ended, do the same. Still add information information or comments or questions um, into the chat area and we will make sure to respond to you later. If you've got a question, um, I send those questions straight to the expert and then get replies that I can comment back. Um, one more thing I want to make sure to put up there before we dive into all the content today is our Iowa, Iowa Concern phone number. Um, Iowa Concern is a 24-7 free resource for any of just life's um, hiccups, uh, road bumps. I mean, all the things that can come your way when you're just feeling like maybe you're experiencing a little more than you can handle, or maybe you know someone else that is, you can call Iowa Concern for free resources, free help. Um, and they're just a really, really great resource for all of um, Iowans. So make sure to jot that phone number down, whether you need it or someone else might. All right. Are you ready, Randall? Yeah. Okay. I mean, this is your thing. So it's like, this is, this is what you do. <laughs> yeah you just you just take it all right well i'm hopping off and i'm gonna start taking my notes okay great um so thank you for the introduction my name is randall paul cass i am the b extension specialist at iowa state university 
and actually tomorrow will mark me being at the university for three whole years. So that's pretty exciting for me. Um, I, with my job, it's phenomenal. It's kind of my dream job. I get to maintain our honey production apiary that we have here in Ames. I also get to talk to beekeepers, farmers, and landowners about best management practices to improve pollinator health. Um, and then I get to coordinate some pretty cool groups like IPM for Bees and uh, the Pollinator Working Group that connects uh, people invested in pollinator conservation across the state. And more recently, I'm starting more projects to um, increase beekeeping outreach to bilingual populations, uh, Spanish speaking populations and, and underserved communities. So I'm pretty excited about that. But today I'm going to be talking about um, winterizing beehives. So uh, it's, this is meant to be a brief presentation. So I will just briefly be going through some of the considerations people should take into account. I, I see this presentation as something suitable for new beekeepers that haven't uh, overwintered their bees or folks that are interested in beekeeping and want to know what they'd really be getting into uh, when they're in it for the long haul. And it's a topic that I've enjoyed learning a lot about since I moved here to Iowa because most of my beekeeping background has been in warm places or tropical places. Um, and so it wasn't until I moved here that I had to worry about uh, taking care of your bees in the snow. So <laughs> there's a, and it's something that you really need to consider as an Iowan because we have pretty high annual losses coming out of winter here in Iowa. Um, the past few years, it's been around 50% loss. Um, which is which is pretty bad. That means if you had ten hives, you you ended up losing um, five. Or if you had ten hives, you ended up losing five of them. So it's something that you should be worried about. Uh, and there's several factors that contribute to the hive loss uh, during the winter, um, and those include pests and pathogens, starvation, moisture, and then of course the our our cold temperatures. Um, so a lot of people ask me what bees do in the wintertime when we're here in Iowa. Um, and I like to tell them that they, they fly south for the winter, but that, that's a lie. Um, they, they actually stay in their, in their hives and they don't, they don't leave much unless they're doing a cleansing flight where they, they can empty out their system and come back in. Uh, but for the most part, they stay in a, a, what we call a cluster in the center, around the center of the hive. And it's similar to what penguins do uh, in the cold winters in, uh, in the Arctic, uh, in the Antarctic, uh, where they kind of rotate around, but they, they try to maintain that warm cluster around the queen. And so that's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about overwintering the hive is how to keep that cluster alive. Um, so major considerations, six key uh, preparation tools that you need to think about um, are number one, controlling varroa mites. Um, so that's the probably the biggest pest that beekeepers have to deal with. Uh, varroa mite is a, is a little parasite that lives on the back of bees and completes its life cycle in the brood of the bees um, and can spread viruses between bees and overall just weakens a hive. Uh, the second um, key idea is adequate food stores. So when I talked about that cluster of bees in the, in the middle of the hive, um, oftentimes it's too cold for them to leave that little ball. And so sometimes the frames that they're on is the food that they have available to them. So um, you want to make sure that you've got plenty of honey frames, uh, food that they're going to need, because uh, they will eat uh, 60 pounds of honey. Uh, over the course of the winter, uh, we're talking we're talking thousands of bees in there in that clustered ball. So they're going to need a lot to make it through. Uh, third consideration would be moisture control. This is probably one that maybe people don't uh, immediately think of, but as those bees are in that clustered ball, they're they're uh, moving their bodies to keep warm, to create warmth, and they're they're breathing, and all of that can cause um, moisture inside the hive. So um, that moisture can maybe stick to the roof of the hive and, and freeze. And then if we get a warm day, it might thaw and then it might freeze again. So moisture plays a, a big role um, in overwintering hives. So I'll talk about some ways to control moisture. Another uh, consideration is site selection. 
So we don't want to place our hives in a place where they're going to be exposed to extreme wind um, and things like that. I'll talk about some site selection ideas. Uh, number five on this list is wrapping and insulation, which is something that I've learned about a lot since I've come here. Every beekeeper has an opinion about it. And I'll get into a little bit more about tips for, for wrapping and insulating your hives if that's something that you want to do. Uh, and then finally, overwinter monitoring. I think a lot of beekeepers think of, or a lot of people interested in becoming beekeepers think of it as a, as a really easy hobby. And in some ways it is, but it's certainly not a set it and forget it situation. You, you can't really just set up a hive in the spring, harvest honey uh, in the late summer, and then just leave your hives alone. You want to be monitoring them all year, and that includes keeping an eye on them during the winter. So uh, the reason that we're doing this presentation right now, it's, it's not even October and we're already talking about winter, and that's because uh, overwintering prep begins in September. So in September, these are some of the things you want to be asking yourself. The first one, um, is my hive queen right? Uh, queen right refers to having a, a healthy queen that's laying eggs and not having a colony that's queenless or has an old queen that's not laying correctly. So when you take a survey of your hives and you do your inspections, you want to make sure that all of your hives have a, a queen present and that that queen is healthy and laying eggs. You'll need that healthy queen in order to make it through winter. If it's a, if it's a failing queen, and you lose her before you hit the winter time, that hive's gonna be put in a bad position. Uh, another question you wanna ask yourself, uh, how much pollen and honey is in the hive? And this is specifically um, talking about resources because the bees are gonna need a lot of food stores to make it through the winter, and pollen and honey are, are their food stores. You can think of it um, as sort of their, their rice and beans with pollen being their protein source and, and honey being their carbohydrate source. Um, they especially need honey, so more of an emphasis on, on honey for making it through winter. But you want to, when you're doing a September inspection, you want to make sh you want to get an idea of how much honey is in there, so you can get a better idea of whether or not you need a supplementary feed. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, the third question would be, how big are my colonies? For example, if you've got just booming colonies, ju just you know every single frame is covered in bees, then you're in a pretty good spot. But if you have colonies that look like they're struggling a bit or their populations are really low, then, then you might want to combine uh, colonies together, whether that's combining uh, two smaller colonies together or a smaller and a larger colony together. Uh, then the fourth question you have to ask yourself is, uh, do my colonies have mites? And uh, this can be tough for some beekeepers. A lot of beekeepers uh, <laughs> want to remain uh, willful, willfully ignorant of the mite levels inside their hives. Some beekeepers don't even want to check for mites, but it's important to know uh, the mite populations inside your hives because these parasites are, are one of the major contributors to, to hive loss. Um, if it hasn't been clear already from what I've been talking about, there's a lot of different factors that can affect your hive and its ability to survive the winter. And mites are, are one of those big factors. Um, so there's a few different ways that you can check for mites too, and I'll be discussing that on the next slide, I believe. All right, uh, let's talk about managing mites. Um, like I just said, most hives have mites, um, and if you beekeepers don't keep their mites under control, um, they can create problems for, for beehives uh, in their neighborhood. You know, maybe their neighbor keeps bees and if their hive has really high mite loads and their hive is failing, the neighbor's bees might, you know, try to take advantage and, and rob out the failing hive, steal some of their honey for themselves. And when they do that, the mites jump on their back and you just kind of get this never ending domino effect of, mites taking over a hive, causing it to fail and moving on to the next hive. Uh, that's what uh, a hive that's failing because of mites is considered uh, what we call a mite bomb. So uh, there's a few different ways to get an idea of how many mites are in your hive uh, before you make a decision about treating for mites. Uh, we have three different videos that we've put online here at ISU um, that show you three different methods for monitoring mites and getting a good mite count. Um, there's the alcohol wash that involves, that's in the photo right here. Uh, it involves taking a, a half cup of bees and putting them in a, a cup of, of alcohol or, or ethanol. 
and um, mixing that around, which causes the mites to fall off the backs of the bees. And then you can see in that photo, that beekeeper is counting the number of mites that have fallen off the bees. A half cup of bees is the equivalent of uh, 300. So if you put 300 bees in the alcohol wash and you find that you have five, uh, you find that you have, um, I don't know, nine mites, then you can divide that by three and you would have three mites per 100 bees or 3% uh, of your bees would have uh, mites on them. So that's how you calculate the percentage of mites that you have in your hive. And that's a useful tool for, um, as, uh, for deciding whether or not you need to treat. Generally for a hive, if you have 3% mites, which means that in your when you checked mites on half a cup of bees, you found nine, which would be 3%. Uh, that means that you should treat. Uh, and there's a lot of different uh, tools in the toolkit for treating mites. Um, I know some beekeepers are concerned about keeping things natural. They don't want to use any synthetic chemicals. And there's a lot of natural options out there. That includes um, Apigard or Thymol, which is uh, based on the plant thyme. It's, it's a derived chemical from the natural chemical from thyme. There's oxalic acid and formic acid, which are naturally occurring um, acids that um, through their vapors, uh, it's something that will kill the mites inside the hive. And then there's also chemical control, synthetic chemicals like uh, Amitraz, which um, is known as Apivar um, on the market. And that would be uh, another option there for treatment. But fall's a great time to treat because you have all of your, you've harvested your honey, you have all your honey supers off your hive, and you don't have to worry about the mite treatments uh, affecting your honey. So this is this is probably one of the this is prime time for mite treatment for sure. Uh, another consideration would be how much how much food you have in your hive, and there's a few different ways that you can boost your hive stores. But before you uh, think about boosting your hive stores, you want to get a good idea of how much honey is already in the hive. So um, you can do that in a, a few ways. You can inspect your hive and see how many honey frames you have. Generally, you want about 10 full frames of honey for each hive if it's two deeps. So that's basically one deep full of honey frames. Um, you can get a good idea of how, how much honey is in your hive because honey is the heaviest thing in your hive. So if you have a scale, um, you can either get a, a scale like a postal scale that you can lift the hive up on and set on there. Or you can even get what's called a, a tiltway scale where you can, um, it's basically you, using leverage, you can tilt the hive up and get a fairly accurate read of how heavy your hive is. So however you do it, if you weighing your hive is an option for you and something you're interested in, in doing, uh, your average hive that's about two deeps high, you're gonna want it to weigh between 100 and 120 pounds. Uh, that will tell you that you've got around enough honey stores to make it through the winter. Um, if you weigh your hives or if you do your inspection and you realize that there's not a lot of honey stores in there, uh, you might want to produce your own, uh, you might want to feed them corn syrup, which you can buy commercially, or you can make your own sugar syrup, uh, which is the same thing uh, as like making simple syrup for a cocktail, um, which is nice. So you can have multi-purpose use of this, the, your homemade sugar syrup. Uh, generally, it would be a two to one ratio sugar to water. So maybe two pounds of sugar and uh, one pound of water. Um, so that, that would be a way to make your own uh, food stores. And then if you're looking to feeding, there's a, there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, I thought I'd throw these images up there to show you how. So they've got uh, feeders that you can insert that basically cover the top of the, the 10 frames inside your hive. Um, and I think that those, those feeders that cover the whole, all the frames, I think that those are um, two, two to four gallons that you can get in there. Uh, then you've got the uh, the black number three up there. You've got the the black insert um, feeders. So you would essentially remove two frames and replace those two frames with that feeder, and that can hold, I think, two gallons. Uh, number two up there is just a bucket with the holes drilled in it. Um, a lot of folks will actually cut a hole in their top cover and then and then screw on a. a a little piece of metal so that they can slide back and forth to open it and close that hole. And then you can put one of those feeders upside down on there with the holes drilled in it 
and the bees can come up and, and take the, the syrup as needed. But one of the simplest ways, and, and this is in photo number four, and this is what we've done frequently here at ISU, we uh, fill a gallon bag with, with the sugar syrup, and then we just poke holes in that and, and set it on top of the frames. You can see there, we have put um, a, a honey super uh, on top to give it some space so we're not just squishing all that sugar out when we put the lid on. But that would be another, you know, sometimes the, the best solution is the simplest. So if you're just filling some bags with sugar syrup and poking holes in it for them to feed on, that works too. As I mentioned before, moisture is a major killer of bees during the winter. And uh, because the, the moisture can freeze and then thaw and then freeze and then thaw, uh, so the, the bees will end up getting covered in water and freezing themselves. There's a few different ways to control for this. Uh, again, we have traditionally used a very simple solution here at ISU where we drill a, a small hole uh, in the backside of the hive, um, usually on the second deep and right under where the, where the handle is. And so I, I, this was the only photo I could find where you could clearly see it, um, but we've drilled a small hole in the back of the hive. And that way we, it allows between the entrance and that small hole for, for air to flow in and out. Uh, because contrary to popular belief, you do need airflow inside your hive. You, even though it's winter, cool air, uh, you need an outlet for that moisture. Drilling a hole is a really simple way to do it. You can also um, create an upper entrance as well as the bottom main entrance by using an inner hive cover. Um, um, most inner hive covers have a little notch in them that can be used as a small entrance. And that would, of course, create uh, a space for moisture to flow out of the hive. You can also purchase a moisture board or a quilt box. And on the next slide, I have some photos of those. So number one right there is what's referred to as a quilt box, which sounds not, it sounds nice, it sounds insulating, it sounds comfortable, but essentially what it is is a, a small um, frame that you can place on top of your hive and the bottom of it is, a, is canvas or fabric and folks will put uh, wood shavings in there. You can go and get, um, pet shavings like you would use for a hamster. And you can set that in your quilt box. And then that, the, between the, the canvas or fabric on the bottom and the wood shavings there on top, it will absorb some of that moisture. And then photo number three is a moisture board, which is just a, a board designed to, to put right there on top of the inner cover. And it's sort of like a sponge that will absorb moisture over the winter. And then photo number two is just a picture of an inner cover with that notch in there. Um, you could put that, uh, use that inner cover as, uh, as creating a, an extra entrance uh, at the top of your hive so that the, you have that flow of air consistently going through. And in terms of wrapping and insulating, this is something that's been fascinating for me because it wasn't something I had encountered in beekeeping before moving to the Midwest. Uh, so wrapping refers to uh, putting, uh, basically wrapping your hive in something black and the idea behind it is that black will attract heat from the sun. Um, so oftentimes people have their hives painted a lighter color like white and by um, putting something black on there, uh, there's potential for the, the sun to heat it up during the day and it can take, you can take advantage of, of the sun's heat basically to keep your hives warm and, and basically mediate uh, temperatures a little, a little better during the winter making the bees have to work less to get their temperatures up. Because that, that, that cluster ball will uh, heat up to be up to 90 degrees uh, during the winter time just to keep the, the bees alive. So wrapping is one option um, and it seems to be something that there's, there's not a lot of scientific data on, but beekeepers either swear by it or don't believe that it really works. So it depends on the beekeeper you talk to. But if it's something that you're interested in doing, uh, there's a lot of different wrapping materials. You can just get uh, roofing material or tar paper and just wrap those around your hive, uh, just something that's black in color. In this photo, we have uh, wax coated cardboard boxes. So these were commercially produced boxes specifically for wrapping the hive. And they're made out of that material like the political yard signs would use, that corrugated, it, it's kind of like cardboard, but it's it's coated in a, in a, in a wax or a plastic. And those are black, they fit uh, snugly right over the hive. And you can see in that photo that there's a little hole at the top 
um, to make sure that there's still airflow. Because when you wrap your hives, you don't want to suffocate them. It's not like you're wrapping them in, in cellophane to keep them completely enclosed. Moisture is a big deal, and you want to make sure that you have an outlet for that moisture to keep that airflow going. And then there's also some different, on, on beekeeping websites, you can find commercial beekeeping wraps to wrap your hive as well. Now, as far as insulation goes, someone uh, might just initially think, you know, hey, I want to insulate the sides of the hive and insulate it the whole way around just to create that extra level of warmth. But actually what that, uh, if you were to insulate your entire hive, you might get sort of an igloo cooler effect where it mediates the temperature. So when it's warm in there, it keeps it a little bit warmer. But when it cools in there, it's going to keep it a lot colder as well. So we don't recommend, if you decide to use insulation, we don't recommend um, putting insulation around the sides of the hive. But a, a very common insulation method is to put a piece of foam insulation on top of your inner cover um, and then under your hive cover. Uh, and that could potentially prevent some of the heat from escaping uh, out, but still allow some of the moisture to escape out. When selecting a winter site, uh, most beekeepers like to keep their hives uh, at the same place year round. Uh, however, if they're keeping their hives at a place where they're exposed to wind or even kind of in a, a bit of a, a dip in the ground or a valley where maybe cold air could, could come in and create sort of a, a refrigeration effect, those are some things you want to avoid. So if you do have your hives at a site where they could be exposed to extreme winds or, or you know, extreme cold, you may want to move them. And so a few recommendations we have is, is putting them against a, a big tree line. You can see in that photo at one of our research apiaries, we have our bees close to a tree line. And that tree line protects them from um, northern winds. So they're south of the tree line. Uh, I've, in my experience here, it seems like we get a lot of winds from the north and from the west. So that's one thing to consider. And we've even overwintered at a few sites where we've been um, south of a tree line versus north of a tree line. And just anecdotally, our hives did a lot better at sites south of the tree line than north of it. But not just a tree line, you could also put them you know, at the side of a shed or um, you could even construct your own, you know, maybe, maybe take apart some wooden pallets and construct your own little barrier wall uh, as, a, as a safe place to keep your hives to overwinter. And then there's a few other considerations I wanted to briefly talk about. Uh, like I said, I haven't gone too far in depth into a lot of these, these uh, different ideas, so people are welcome to ask me further questions. But a couple other considerations I want to throw out there was uh, mice. So as I mentioned, the, the bees are, are clustering in a ball and, and creating a whole lot of warmth, and that'll attract a, a lot of families of mice. Uh, there have been a lot of springs where we open up hives and you know find all these mice babies at the bottom of the hive. So you want to avoid that. And there's some simple tools for it. You could um, get uh, an entrance reducer, which is a little piece of wood that, that makes the entrance really small that only a, hand, a handful of bees can go in and out. So you could put an entrance reducer across your entrance. You could buy um, some thick hardware cloth and just kind of roll that over and, and shove that in your entrance. And the hardware cloth will be have thick enough holes in it that the bees can get through, but something like a mouse couldn't. And then in this photo, if you if you look closely, you can see that our entrance, we've actually bought some of these um, mouse guards that, that they sell. And essentially it's, it's a piece of metal. Uh, and then in the corners, you can um, drill it with, with screws uh, into the entrance. And there's just little tiny holes in it that are big enough for bees to get through, but not mice. Uh, another consideration is um, fondant or candy boards. So this is sugar in sort of a, a hard candy format format in, in a hard candy form uh, that you can put on top of your inner cover and on warmer days during the winter bees could go up and collect that. You want it to be something hard, a candy border fondant it isn't liquid uh, because liquid can freeze, liquid can drip down and that's something that you want to avoid. Uh, in the past we've put uh, fondant on, our, on some of our hives and a lot of our hives just kind of ignore it and then it's something that we have to deal with in the spring. Um, but there's other beekeepers that swear by using fondant and candy boards just to provide bees with a little bit of emergency food stores. And speaking of emergency food stores, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the top of the presentation, monitoring your hives is something that you want to do year round. 
So you can see in this photo, we're, we're actually weighing our hives. And I think this photo I actually took um, two years ago uh, during the polar vortex. We were out there and it was something like negative 20 degrees with wind. I thought I was going to lose a couple of fingers because I didn't bring my gloves. But we were still monitoring our hives during the winter, not opening our hives. You really don't want to open your hives if it's uh, you know below 50 degrees. But if you do have, sometimes we have those warm days in late January, early February, where it gets, you know, 45 or closer to 50 degrees, you can maybe briefly open up your hive just to check and, and look into the hive, maybe not pull any frames um, and see how well that cluster is doing and see whether or not they might need an emergency feeding. Just to briefly talk about what an emergency feeding might look like. The simplest way, and it's not recommended to do generally only in emergency situations. Uh, you could lay newspaper down on the top of the frames and then just uh, sprinkle uh, a good a layer of granulated sugar across the top. The, that way the sugar is not going to fall down into the hive, but the bees can eat through that newspaper and collect that sugar whenever it's warm enough for them to leave the cluster and do so. So that's sort of a last ditch effort to get your hive through the winter um, through an emergency feeding. And as the next slide shows, uh, emergency mite treatments are possible as well. So this is an overwintering timeline that was made by trusty Iowa beekeeper, Lynn Wilbur, who's, who lives near here to Ames and has helped us out with a lot of projects. Um, so in his timeline, in August is when he pulls his supers. So that's when he harvests the honey. And then he does his first mite treatment there in September. In September and October, uh, he he's weighed his hives and made sure that he's he's feeding them their their sugar supplements um, if they're underweight. And then in November is whenever he puts uh, wrappings on his hives and maybe some insulation. He decides to do uh, oxalic acid vapor treatment then in December and January. That is a mite treatment um, that is effective when there's no capped brood in the hive. Uh, so December and January is a great time to do it because the queen hasn't been laying eggs and there's no brood there. So there's no place for the mites to hide. Um, that's not something that's that every beekeeper does. Uh, that's kind of really going the extra mile. But if you've done your mite treatments in September and you do a mite check through an alcohol wash or a sugar shake and you see that those treatments haven't been super effective, um, then you might want to do an emergency treatment there October, November, and December before it gets too cold. And oxalic acid would be uh, a great choice because there's very little brood in the hive at that time of year. Then uh, on this calendar, January through March, just keep monitoring and uh, feed the hives if necessary through that emergency method that I talked about. Just to get them through to April, whenever we've got our first dandelions and it's starting to get warm and the bees have some new uh, sources of, of nectar and pollen for the new year. For those of you that don't already have bees, uh, the winter is a great time to think about taking a beekeeping class. If you go to the Iowa Honey Producers Association website, uh, you can find a list of all the classes offered each year. Um, I know that the state apiarist Andy Joseph offers classes in Ankeny in January and February. They meet weekly in the evenings um, and it's a great time to, to just Learn beekeeping 101. I really recommend taking a class, getting a beekeeping mentor before you get started, because in beekeeping, uh, you really don't want to be reinventing the wheel. It's very easy to make stupid mistakes. So uh, going in as informed as you can before you get started is probably the best option. Additionally, in wintertime, that's when you want to think about ordering bees. You know, a lot of people think about beekeeping midsummer, but by then it's kind of already too late to get a hive started. So January and February is where you're going to want to think about ordering bees, and then you can get them delivered to you in, in April or May and get started on your first year of beekeeping. And that's my presentation. That was unbelievable, Rand. <laughs> I've been waiting. I've been waiting for what thirty four minutes to say that. <laughs> uh, seriously though, I did. Learn, I'm sorry. I'm laughing at myself. Um, I really learned a lot, and I, I have I, the, the notes I wrote are starting to look actually a lot like how you take care of your own kids. You you know you keep an eye on what they're eating, make sure they're warm, check them for bugs. You know, just like it's just winterizing bees, kids. It it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> And I cannot stress enough. Every time you said mites, I started, you know, you start 
They just feel itchy, like they're on you. <laughs> yep, they're pretty disgusting. <sighs> Start feeling itchy. Um, I definitely noted down too that making the sugar syrup solution good for bees and cocktails. I did note that down. It came from a university specialist. <laughs> I cannot forget that. Um, okay, well, I threw so many links into the chat as you were talking. So um, again, if you're on here live or if you're tuning in later, make sure you you'll find like amazing videos in the chat, links um, to YouTube videos that show that uh, how to do the alcohol wash or the ether roll or what was the other one? Sugar, sugar shake. sugar shake. And um, I enjoy those videos because they're nice, short, fun music and you get to see all of that. Um, so yeah, tons and tons and tons of resources. Uh, one that I want to make sure we highlight um, is the Pollinator Working Group page. Uh, again, that link is going to be in the chat where you can just click on it, but it's right here too. And that's kind of where you would say for most of our extension B resources, this is a good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from that website, you can get links to everything from uh, who can help remove these bees from my backyard to <laughs> how do I get started beekeeping uh, to where do I find a, a club that I can join to uh, checking out our Instagram where we're regularly posting photos. So. You are. You're very regular and I appreciate it on that. Um, okay, so, and that was actually, you just said something that was a question we had come in. What do I do if a bee swarm is on my property? So first off, can you just give an idea of what a bee swarm is? Yeah, absolutely. So when a bee, when a, when a colony decides that its home is no longer suitable or um, they're getting too big for their space, uh sometimes they'll they'll split they'll they'll rear a new queen and the old queen will take half the hive and go try to find a new home mm -hmm. so um a swarm is generally pretty docile a lot of times they'll find a place to swarm on a tree branch and, and again they'll, it'll be a big cluster of bees on a tree branch with with their queen or sometimes unfortunately it'll be on your house um i saw a picture the, last year and it was on somebody's car like it was on the front mm -hmm. of their car and they're like, what do I do? <laughs> like, it's not, do I just drive? <laughs> well, the good news is that um, this is a, this is a, this is free bees for a beekeeper. So what I recommend is going to the Iowa Honey Producers Association website, uh, looking at the list of clubs that are there and mm -hmm. reaching out to the, the club that's nearest you. Um, and if you get in, in touch with that club president, they should be able to find somebody that's nearby you that would be interested in coming and collecting that swarm and adding it to their own apiary. However, there's a lot of people that find paper wasp nests or, or different other wasp nests in their mm -hmm. backyard and they assume that it's bees. So th the folks will probably ask you for, for a photo just to confirm that it's not a wasp nest, it's not bumblebees that you're dealing with, that it's, that it's honeybees specifically. Yeah. And, um, if they see something that they think is a honeybee swarm or, I mean, what do proceed with caution? I am guessing. Honeybee swarms are very <laughs> docile, actually. Um, if you go to the Instagram page, there's a, a video that I made from us collecting a swarm. And I just, I just put my hand right there in the middle of the cluster. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. They're, they're very docile at that point. They're not aggressive. What the swarm is doing is trying to figure out where it's going to live next. Mm. So, it's very fascinating. They have sent out scouts that go out and explore new locations for them to call their new home. They come back um, and then communicating via waggle dance. They communicate to the I other mean, bees. Uh, the, as all the, as all we, the we all do. As site. we all do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they, dance, they dance it out. They communicate all the things <laughs> that this new site has. And then almost democratically, the bees um, choose from the different scouts uh, recommended mm -hmm. locations they democratically choose which one they want to go to, uh, and then they move. So when they're swarming like that on a tree branch or on the side of the house, it's temporary. It hopefully will just take a day or two. Uh, mm -hmm. They're just trying to uh, figure out where they're going to move next. Wow. That is actually really interesting. And now I would like to create a documentary, and I want to be the um, narrator for the bees in the waggle dance. Yeah, it's a new life goal. Okay. Um, some other, we've got a lot of like beginning beekeeper questions. Um, so starting, if I'm interested in it, how many hives should I start with? 
Right. It depends on how much time and resources you want to put into it. I recommend um, never starting with just one, but definitely at least two. Okay. Um, every bee colony is different. And if you're a beginning beekeeper, you might not know what's normal or what you should expect. So sometimes what's nice about having two hives is that it can be a point of comparison. Mm. Maybe, maybe one hive is really collecting a lot of nectar, a lot of honey, and the other hive isn't. And that would be an indicator that the hive that's not collecting might have something wrong with it. Or maybe in one hive, you see that they're only, uh, you're only seeing a lot of drone bees, which are the male bees, rather than the female bees, which are the workers. Um, but in your second hive, they're doing just fine and there's tons of female bees. So it, it's, especially as a beginning beekeeper, I recommend getting two hives so that you can you can compare the two and, and that'll at least inform you a little bit better on, on whether or not there's something you should be worried about going on in the hive when you inspect it. <laughs> Easy enough. I can handle that. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So you've got your two hives or more. Um, how far apart are you looking at spacing them? Yeah. It, so bees do what we call, bees will do this thing called drifting. So uh, if you have hives that are closer together, a, a forager bee will leave the hive, go collect pollen or nectar, and it'll come back. But it might get confused if the hives are really close together. It's got an internal GPS system. It knows where it left. It knows the general vicinity of where it flew out from. But sometimes it's not 100% sure mm -hmm. which hive it was. Mm -hmm. uh, some studies showed that even up to, you know, 30 or 40% of bees in a hive might be from a different colony. Oh they might have been foragers that ac accidentally drifted. If they have better so, snacks, I, right. I would go to a new hive too, honestly. Right. And this is something that we are aware of. It can be a big problem for things like spreading mites between mm -hmm. hives. So if that's a if that's a major concern, you want to keep your hives around 10 feet apart. Okay. Uh, another option you could do if you have them closer together, uh, studies show that bees uh, can recognize symbols or and some colors. They, they can't see red, but they can see different colors. So if your hive was painted a different color, mm -hmm. or maybe one hive has a big red or a big blue circle above the entrance, the other one has a big green square above the entrance, That's that would uh, be helpful for the bees in, in navigating and yeah. remembering which hive is theirs. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, again, I'm thinking of my kids and they would respond to that too. Um, <laughs> how much honey comes from a hive? I'm sure there's so many variances to this. Right. Um, <laughs> I think you can expect anything from, uh, 30 to 60 pounds of honey off of a, off of a hive, uh, in a given year. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this year we had maybe 35 to 40 pounds pounds of honey come off of our uh, our new ISU apiary hives on average but that um it was on the lower side because we were putting brand new frames mm -hmm. inside the hives that had foundation on the frames so first the bees had to draw out the honeycomb before they started storing the honey in there and that that takes a lot of work from the hive so um, rather than focusing on only collecting honey, they also had to focus on constructing this comb. And so that took a lot of uh, energy away, especially because this was the first year with these frames. Next year, I'm expecting to get a lot more honey because we'll already have the honeycomb drawn out on the frames. And so all they have to focus on is bringing that honey and storing it. So when you collect this honey, where does it go? Is it on campus? Is it oh, somewhere? So how our, far do I have to go to get your hun that honey? Our honey apiary <laughs> is just north of Ames at the Horticulture Research Station. And luckily there we have all the uh, these food safe buildings because they're always handling produce and things like that. So we have a, a big extractor that we put all the honey frames in. It's like a big centrifuge that we spin around and then we we strain that honey and we, we put it in storage buckets and then we bottle it. Um, so it's, it's raw honey, it's pure honey. Uh, we have to make sure that it's water content isn't too high, uh, which we made sure of these past few weeks um, because if it has high water content, it could ferment in the bottle. Oh. And this week we're gonna begin bottling it, which is very exciting. Uh, I, I don't think we have a link to this, but if, the, the first place that we're selling out of, uh, there's already pre-sales going on on the Horticulture Research Station website. So if folks are interested in buying a bottle of honey, that's where they can go right now. Okay. 
Well, I'll find that link and make sure to throw it in the comments afterwards, after yeah. I order my own to make sure that I can get some. <laughs> um, is it named something? Does it have a name? It's called uh, I, I, Iowa State University Honey. Oh, we can <laughs> we can do better than that. We can do better than that. Okay. Yeah. Um, these are my own questions. So I'll get back to other questions that people really want to know. Um, okay. So if you're going to start beekeeping, are there special permissions? You know, I don't know if you where based off where you live, maybe, or is yeah, that going to vary there, there too? Is a, I think there, there's a website out there. I believe it's called Iowa Bee Laws. So you can look up your city. Most cities allow urban beekeeping um, within the city limits, but there are a handful that do not. So mm -hmm. If you do just have a residence in a town or a city and you want to double check, you can go to the Iowa Bee Laws website, website and they've created a pretty uh, comprehensive list of what the laws for most towns are. I'll find that too and throw that in the chat. But now I'm thinking too, would it be like, would you recommend some common courtesy of like letting your neighbors know? Like There's other things like that? <laughs> There's There's two ways to think about it. The first is... Um, you know, let everyone know and get everyone on board that you might have bees, more people might see more bees in their backyard. Yeah. Um, the other tried and true option is to keep your hives in a place where <laughs> no one else can see them and then no one will come knocking on your door accusing oh, you like that. of, uh, you know, their, their kids got stung <laughs> or- It probably wasn't your bee. Bees will be docile. I, I would think that most stings, especially from foraging bees in someone else's backyard, those foragers mm -hmm. have a one track mind if they're honeybees, they're really just looking for nectar and pollen. They're not looking to sting anybody. Oftentimes people get stung on the foot walking around in the grass uh, where there's maybe some low growing clover that the bees are foraging on and they accidentally step on the bee. But for the most part, bees aren't out to sting anybody um, unless they feel like their hive is being attacked um, or they personally are being attacked personally or they themselves <laughs> are, are, are being squished. Uh, I feel way. I would respond negatively if I was being squished. But if um, um, allergies are a concern, um, that would be another factor. If, if someone uh, goes into anaphylactic shock, they know that they uh, have anaphylactic reactions as a result of being stung. Mm. Um, that would be another consideration. Yeah. Um, okay. We have a couple of questions coming in. Um, do you anticipate trying other hive types in the future? Um, this person starting beekeeping with, and I don't know how to pronounce that. Lanes, lanes. I'm not a sure. Good wintering statistics. I, I've not used a, a lanes hive before. I know that there are hives called top bar hives, where instead of going vertical, the hives go horizontal with the mm. same frames in there. And there's been mixed overwintering success uh, with those. I know that my colleagues at the University of Nebraska Lincoln have been able to successfully overwinter at least one year using um, the top bar hives, but generally have really good success with the traditional hives, which are the mm -hmm. ones that I showed in the photos called Langstroth, yeah. Langstroth hives. Um, so at this point, we haven't started experimenting with other different hive, hive types yet. Uh, it's something I would be open to uh, looking at, collaborating with other people, trying to get a better idea of if there are better ways to overwinter hives. The Langstroth hive, the one that most people use, is, has been used for the past 200, 300 years. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways, it's sort of like a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it situation. Yeah. But I, I would be interested to learn more about other people's success rates with, with other types of hive body shape. Yeah, so if you're watching this and you've used other types of hives, let us know what you're seeing, what you've experienced. All right, we've got a question. Um, if you are living in an apartment complex or something like that, are there designated places in Iowa that you know of that you could rent land? Or would this be like a find a neighbor or family member that might have space and be interested in you using their land? Right. I think that, um, so as part of my job, I also conduct surveys with uh, farmers and landowners and beekeepers. And one thing that my survey results are telling me is that a lot of landowners would be interested, you know, they've got large acreage, and uh, some mm -hmm. of the pollinator habitat, they would be interested in keeping bees on their land. So one of my goals over the next year is trying to improve communication between people that have great bee habitat and beekeepers that don't have a place to keep their bees. Yeah. So that maybe we can form more connections and more beekeepers can get their hives on, on, um, on pollinator habitat. 
-hmm. because here in Iowa, we have sort of a, a feast and famine situation. You know, 85% of our land is devoted to agriculture. The majority of that is row crop agriculture. Mm -hmm. So it's plants that are blooming at the same time all at once, and then nothing's blooming. Yeah. So here in Iowa, soybean blooms in July, and bees will forage on the soybean. Uh, each There's tons of flowers. Each flower gives a little bit of nectar. And so for Iowa honeybees, soybean can be a good resource in the middle of summer. But once that soybean's done blooming, you know, especially when farmers are controlling for different flowering weeds and things like that, uh, there's nothing for the bees to feed on. And so yeah. all the honey stores that they've, uh, all the honey that they've collected in July, then they start to eat that all through uh, August and September and October. And then, uh, and then it's time to overwinter and they've already eaten all their food and can't make it through. So and one consideration- 60, pound, 60 pounds of honey, is that what you said? That they eat in the winter? Um, yeah, up to 60. So. Uh, we really want those heavy hives because, you know, yeah. the big heavy hives are the ones that are going to make it through the winter. So when considering where you're going to keep your hives, make sure that there's a lot of uh, floral resources available to them. Mm. Um, and yeah, like you said, if you're looking for a site, you, you know, you're, you're a city dweller, you don't own your own property, you can't keep your hives there. You're going to want to reach out to friends, family members. Um, yeah, we've got some land. I mean, groups. Community gardens often are excited to keep bees and yeah, because like you're since they're pollinators. I mean, you'll have a stronger habitat if they have a presence there. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of plants that um, that produce uh, higher yields as a result of having bees nearby. Mm -hmm. not, not every single plant needs bees for pollination. Um, a lot of our veggie crops don't need pollination. You know, something like lettuce is going to grow. It doesn't have flowers to pollinate. Uh, corn is wind pollinated. But uh, things like melons really benefit from having bees nearby. Different berries. Um, and then, of course, like fruit trees and things like that really mm. benefit from having bees around to pollinate. That's interesting. Lettuce does not need bees. I mean, so if you I learned are something breeding, new. <laughs> you're breeding your own varieties of of these plants, um, you know, broccoli or lettuce or things like that, then having bees around uh, would help produce, you know, help cross pollinate them where you could collect collect the seed and then <laughs> plant that the next year. But for the part that we consume, bees aren't necessarily needed. Nothing. Okay, um, let's see. We had another question about ordering bees. Um, how do you know you're buying the best bees? Like what are some things, if you're gonna order bees, what would you suggest on like, you know, where, how, how to select where they're buying them from or what things they're looking for when they're deciding, you know, what to buy. Yeah. And there's a lot of different types of bees. They're referred to as bee races. So they're the most common used bee races are uh, carniolan and Italian uh, varieties, but then there's also Buckfast and Russians and they all have uh, are reported to have different traits. For example, Carniolans supposedly overwinter better than Italians because the Italian queens just really like to keep producing brood even though it starts getting cold, whereas the Carniolans will slow down a little bit earlier. There's characteristics like that that you might want to consider and could do research on. So how well they overwinter, um, how quickly they start producing brood in the spring. Um, and then another consideration I would think about is um, what's called uh, varroa sensitive hygienic characteristics. So since the varroa mite is such a nasty pest, oftentimes we try to find bees that um, that are a slightly more resilient or have an edge when confronting the, the varroa mite. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's those that have hygienic characteristics where they can sense that the varroa is in the brood. So they'll d dig in there and remove the brood that's got the varroa on it and throw it out of the hive. That's considered hygienic behavior. There's some other bees out of Purdue that are called the ankle biters because they're bees that have a, a characteristic where when they find Varroa in the hive, they grab it, they chew its legs off, and then they oh, throw gosh. it to the side. I mean, it's <laughs> intense. <laughs> there are certain traits that you can ask for. So when you're trying to source bees, you can ask if they have any Varroa-resistant traits or Varroa-sensitive hygienic traits. The problem with genetics is the it's hard to control for future generations of mm. bees. So maybe if a, if a queen does have these genetics, 
Uh, when a queen mates with drones, she'll, she'll do usually just one mating flight for her whole life. She'll go on her virgin mating flight, mate with up to 20 different drones. And those drones all have completely different genetic material from her. And so you don't have a lot of control over what the queen's offspring look like. They may get traits. They may get those great traits that she's been bred for, but they may get traits from, from one of the random drones that she's mated with. So honeybee genetics is a, is a complicated, complex. I was just going to say, I'm like, who but knew? You can hedge your bets by trying to seek out queens that have been bred for some of these good characteristics like overwintering or uh, varroa resistance. Gotcha. Okay. I think we've kind of neared the end of our questions. Is there anything yeah. that's come to your mind that you want to make sure we um, share before we kind of close off here? Yeah. I always like to say um, a lot of people are concerned about, uh, they hear the phrase, save the bees. Mm. And a lot of people equate that with honeybees. Mm. Um, but actually we have um, close to, you know, 300 species of bee here in Iowa. And most of them are native bees and they don't live in colonies. They're, they're solitary bees. They nest underground. They nest in stems or in holes in wood. Um, and these bees, we're seeing their populations decline at really fast rates. We're seeing all insect populations decline. And um, while we'd like to think of honey and we like to think of honeybees when we talk about save the bees, really the, the honeybees don't, honeybees don't need saving, but native species of bee do. Mm. Honeybees, a, a colleague recently referred to them this way. Uh, you can think of them as sort of like cows. They're, they're a form of livestock for us. There, there's no one out there saying we need to save the cows. The, the cows <laughs> are doing just fine. We can, you know, produce new cows when we need to in the same way we can produce new honeybees when we mm. need to. But with native species, that's not something that we have control. They're not semi-domesticated like honeybees are something that we have a lot less control over. So what I always try to promote is people thinking about the different native species of bee that we have here in Iowa, different types of bumblebees or sweat bees or longhorn bees. They're beautiful. They do a lot of great pollination work, sometimes even more effective than honeybees, but they're the ones that are, um, are facing the biggest challenges. And there's a lot of things that we can do that support both honeybees and native bees. And I think that the biggest one is creating more habitat. Mm. Well, if you can do what you can to um, to plant more uh, native plants that attract these native bees, that provide more pollen and nectar resources for these native bees, they uh, a lot of times they're more specialists, they're more attracted to native plants. Whereas honeybees, which aren't native, they came over from Europe, um, they're, they're generalists and they'll, they'll feed on plants as well. So the more native plants that we can plant we're, uh, and the more space nesting space we can create, for native species of bee, um, it's going to kind of float all bee boats. It'll be something yeah. that's good for native species as well as honeybees, which are which are great to keep and they're phenomenal insects and they're so fascinating. But the honeybees aren't aren't in need of being saved. We need yeah. to be looking out for their their native sister bees. That's a good differentiation because I think our minds go right away to that honeybee when we think save the bee. So it's, yeah. And I love a good analogy. So now I'm never going to look at a honeybee and not think of a cow. So <laughs> there are a little cow. <laughs> a little moo, yeah. a little movie. Um, I did. I just put a link in the comments to an article I found from our small farm specialist on keeping bees in CRP. That's my article. Um, oh, well, I just I really valued that content, and I, I actually <laughs> did not. I probably saw your face on it earlier when I grabbed that. But yeah, so you were just talking about planting more native. Um, plants and that would be some good uh, information there to go off of. Um, okay, well, I have a couple more things I wrote down that I'll throw into the comments. Um, you mentioned earlier the Iowa Bee Laws. I know that I'm going to look for that link and put it in there for people to access if interested. But again, if you're watching this later after the live's over and you have a comment or a photo or a question, anything like that you want to share, put them in the comment section and I'll make sure that we get that information to our expert. And if, if you need a response or an answer, he will get back to you. Well, he'll give me the information and I'll get back to you. Um, so yeah, his uh, contact information will be coming up on the screen shortly. Um, there's a couple of social media places you can follow, our general Facebook page, also our Twitter account. And then on Instagram, uh, Randall is really active on the Iowa State Bees Instagram page. And I would say that's probably the best resource to be staying like up 
up to date on, you know, what's happening in the world of bees because you're doing the, the bee things. I'm doing are, the bee things. Yeah. yeah. Are you gonna put are you gonna put videos and stuff up when you're bottling the honey? Oh, I, I want to. Okay, so, I hope yeah. you do because I'm very got, interest interested in it. I've got some fun content ideas rolling around in my head. Yeah, so we'll see I see a, a good uh, slow mo video of honey dripping, or maybe like a boomerang. Or yeah, we'll have to <laughs> yeah. we'll have to maybe work together. Um, some good That's hashtags true. for sure. All right, so um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed today. Any questions or things like that that come up, throw them in the chat. I'm gonna put our Iowa Concern um, phone number up here one more time. Again, this is a free 24 seven resource. Um, you can call Iowa Concern, whether it's a concern that maybe you have or uh, something for a friend or family member. But if you're just feeling like there's a little more in life uh, happening right now, then maybe you're able to handle on your own. Iowa Concern is free. 24-7 language interpretation is available as well. Thank you so much for joining me today, Randall. I appreciate it. I anticipate uh, more bee videos in our future. After winter, maybe we can do some live in the field. I'm not going out during the polar vortex. That's I draw my line <laughs> there. That is where the line is drawn. So, all right, everyone, have a good day. And uh, we hope that you have enjoyed this opportunity. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you.